series of Heritage Month talks. Um, we've already had one on the uh, Carpal Creton for Irena Artemieva yesterday, but today is the first of a double bill um, with Spike McCarthy and Bruce Rubridge. The um, brand that the Geo Heritage Division adopt, has adopted is uh, inherited from uh, Spike and Bruce, the story of Earth and life. Our mission is to um, tell the story of Earth and life, and our vision is telling the story of Earth and life to the world. So today we're going to uh, have a story of Earth from uh, the original Spike McCarthy. Thank you. Over to you, Craig. Okay, thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, just a short introduction and a word of thanks, first and foremost, to our sponsor for the month, uh, Tacoma Strategies and Matt Mullins, uh, for helping us to put on these this series of lectures. Uh, Spike is well known to everybody, I think, and he needs very little introduction. Uh, he's a professor emeritus in the School of Geosciences at WITS. He has a wide ranging research interests in the geology and ge geomorphology of Southern Africa. And he, I think he's well known for his publications on the wetlands of the re regions and notably the Okavanga Delta. He is also the author of two best-selling popular books in geology and has lectured widely on acid mine drainage in South Africa. So today he's going to talk to us about Vitz Gold. Spike, over to you. Thanks very much for agreeing to do this for us. Thanks very much, Craig. And um, Chris, thanks so much. And Nolene as well. Uh, <clears throat> they originally, Chris originally asked me, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be a bit scratchy. Um, Chris originally asked me to speak along the lines of the story of Earth and Life. But that book has been around for quite a while now, and uh, I felt it just gets boring. So I wanted to talk about something new and um, new insights into an old problem, and specifically the Witwatersrand goal, Witz gold. Where, what, how did it get there? It's always been a big enigma, and it remains an enigma. Um, and it may be because of the way we look at the basin. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to kick off another thing. Thanks all of you for coming. Much appreciated. Uh, I just want to switch this off. Um, so this is, this is a heritage lecture, but it's not, a, it's not about the heritage of objects, but it's a heritage of knowledge. <clears throat> and uh, we've been learning about the Witwatersrand since 1886, when it was first discovered. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask a, a, sort of a, a, a trail of questions. We're going to go on a, on a question trail and ask random questions about the Wits, or maybe not so random, and, and how these questions have been answered um, over many, many decades. So it'll take you through various angles about the Wits Basin, you know, some of which you may have never even occurred to you, or you may be familiar with. So let's start off. And then we're gonna be dealing primarily with the Wits Basin. <clears throat> so the stratigraphy that concerns us, of course, is the Witwatersrand stratigraphy. stratigraphy but there's the Fentersdorp lava overlying that. Then there's the major unconformity with the Black Reef and the Transvaal on top, and then finally the Karoo. <clears throat> so we're going to strip off these various layers as we go along and look at uh, what's underneath there, and ultimately at the conglomerates that uh, carry the gold over there in the, in the central RAND group. Okay, but before we go there, let's just talk a little bit about discovery. This is the geological map. Uh, it's a map that was prepared by uh, Borches in 1964. And this shows the surface geology as it is today and that, as it was obviously in 1964. They knew more or less everything there was to know about where the, what the, the rocks are and on surface. Um, and it shows also the continental divide. That's the divide in the watershed. So water that falls on the north of that side ends up in the Indian Ocean and water that falls on the south of that line, the divide ends up in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> and that divide passes right through the Lunglachta discovery site, almost, not quite exactly, but very close to it. <clears throat> and um, also you'll notice that there, the Karoo here covers, the Karoo and the Transvaal cover this area. So this is Transvaal poking out, there's this arc it's called the Rand Anticline, and it's along the Rand Anticline that uh, Johannesburg exists. And uh, there, of course, is the Johannesburg Dome in pink, which is the granite dome. <clears throat> okay, now it was worked out long ago by a fellow called John Wellington, who was the professor of geography at Wits University, that the topography we see around us, in other words, the topography of the escarpment of the Witwatersrand, the Klipperfeersberg, 
and also the, the ranges of the Michalisberg and the um, Dustport and so on are all pre-Karoo surfaces <clears throat> and that they were all buried under the Karoo and have been exhumed um, in recent times, relatively recent times. Um, and the reason you can see that very clearly with these superimposed drainages that cut right through uh, across these very hard quartzites and that's one of the characteristics of a superimposed drainage. So when you're looking at the topography around us, you know, the Michalisberg and so on, you've got to realize that that was all covered and shaped by ice uh, 300 million years ago. And now, and then subsequently as the ice, as the ice retreated and in Southern Africa moved further north, they subsequently that land surface was covered by a younger, a upper, upper Karoo sediments, ultimately um, the Drakensberg lavas as well that extended across here. So, um, here's the, another very interesting map. This is the best available geological map of Johannesburg. It was made by Melo uh, between 1910 and 19, about 1916, published in 1917. And there you can see the discovery site. And um, the interesting thing about this is that the, um, although this is all with Bardesant and Achaean in age, you have these outliers here of Karoo. So there's actually coal uh, there's a coal field out um, near Zirbekom, which is just on the way, to, just next to Soweto. There was a coal mining going on there. And uh, if you look at the elevations, the elevations of the discovery site are between 1680 and 1715 meters above sea level. And the Karoo around here, this is the area of Wena Pan. Crew elevation is 1697 to 735. So what that means is that um, the, um, the Karoo, um, would have covered the, the Long Laughter site um, until relatively recently. And um, the erosion that uh, has exposed it is of, uh, must have taken place in the last few million years. So it's quite fortuitous because this, this outcrop along the main reef here is the only place where the conglomerate carries seriously large quantities of gold in outcrop. So had that been covered by Karoo, uh, the chances are we wouldn't have stumbled on the Witwatersrand gold deposits. So it's quite a fortuitous uh, uh, fact. So once the discovery was made, the next thing was to track out the um, to track out the conglomerate layers, and this eventually led to the to the realization that this the full extent of the full extent of the Witwatersrand basin plus all the gold fields. So by 19 late 1950s all the current gold fields had been discovered. And uh, this was published in the first, for the first time in a map by Bob Borchers in 1961. <clears throat> so this Witz Basin with three to four dome at the center there, uh, first became available in, as, as this was his uh, presidential address to the Geological Society in 1961. <clears throat> Okay, now the big question is why is Friedefort at the middle of the Witwatersrand Basin? This is a question we always ask ourselves. And there are two ways of looking at it. This is a way, this diagram on the left is simply what the geology looks like if you took off the Karoo. But if you take off the Ventersdorp as well, but leave the Transvaal behind, then you see much more clearly the relationship between the Wits and the Friedefort Dome. <clears throat> so the Wits is banging, the Friedefort Dome is banging in the middle of the Wits. And this has led to all kinds of weird speculations and possibly a causal connection even um, that the, somehow the Friedefort impact created all the gold and the gold mineralization. And I think there are still some people out there who subscribe to that view. Okay, but why is it? Well, we got a clue if you look at the distribution of the Transvaal over here with all the cover removed. Um, and you see there's the Transvaal has these two basins, this the one, uh, the Pretoria one, and the, <clears throat> this other one, the other uh, Griqualand West one. And there's this funny sickle shaped thing, it's almost like a hand uh, sticking out. Um, and that surrounds three of the fort. And now what I've done here on the left hand side is take the average dip of three degrees on either side here of the Black Reef, and then project it upwards and then assume that that was what the, is what's been eroded, that these two basins were in fact once continuous and the erosion depth then is given by extrapolating the three degree incline or the dip of the Black Reef upwards. And it turns out that over the southern free state, the erosion depth would be about 10 kilometers. <clears throat> so what that means is if this sick, little sickle of Transvaal 
um, that you see here had not been um, formed in the whole of the Witz Basin, the whole of that sickle of the Transvaal and the whole of the Witz Basin underneath it would have been removed by erosion. So it's, it's, it's the, the reason that the Freudefort structure sits in the middle is because it protected the Witwatersrand Basin from erosion. Had it not been there, the Witz would have been eroded away. We just would have had remnants <coughs> of lower Witz uh, in this area. Okay, so that's why it's in the middle. Um, so it's the indentation really that formed by the infolding of the Rimson Canorium that actually protected the Witz and the Transvaal there as well from erosion. But that's got a lot of um, implications, which we'll talk about those later on. Here's another bit of antiquity for the youngsters in the audience. <coughs> this is a map of, the, uh, of the, 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 the depth to the Black Reef, structure contours of the Black Reef, which was prepared by uh, Parpenfuss as part of his PhD thesis in the early 1960s. And here you can see the very salient fact that the, 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 this side of the, of the three out of four dome is overturned, but this side is not. Um, so the whole thing is asymmetrical. And uh, the question is, why is this asymmetrical? And some people think that this is because they, they believe that the projectile that formed it, we assume it's an impact structure, actually came in at a low angle and struck the surface. And that's why it's asymmetrical. But if we look at um, if we look at bomb craters, which are moved made by bomb craters and artillery shells, which are made by flying projectiles, they all have a forward velocity, but that all the craters are round. You don't see a single crater that's um, that's elongated. And of course, bombs that don't explode don't make craters. So as the bombs are being discovered in Europe, <laughs> European cities all the time. Um, undetected because they just don't they just penetrate into the ground and stay there they don't make a hole so it's not actually the impact of the projectile that makes the crater it's the explosion and the explosion is instantaneous and it's got a velocity of the shock wave or the blast wave is moving at orders of magnitude faster than the projectile itself so that it's that movement that creates the um the circular hole uh, so the, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's coming in at an angle or if it's vertical, it'll always make a round hole. Okay, this is Normandy. Uh, this was the beachhead, uh, I think it was uh, Storm Sword Beach, um, where they tried to take out this, uh, this gun battery here. The, the, main, the main landing took place further along the beach where it's not so steep. And there was a platoon, uh, several platoons of Americans that had to scale the cliffs here to try and neutralize this. But that, that was after there'd been a prolonged um, bombardment by the Navy's so sea bombardment and of course aerial bombardment. This was Pinamunda, which is where the, the Germans developed the V2 rocket. This was their test pad and that was also subject to intensive bombing during the war and you'll see all these craters around. So uh, even though the, the, the projectiles that made them had forward velocity. Okay, so why is the Freudefort uh, not round? Well, the thing is it was round um, but it's been tilted by about 2.93 degrees uh, towards the northwest and uh, along an anticlinal axis here, which uh, we call the Bloemfontein anticline. And uh, that's why it's, it's eroded off at an angle. So this is less eroded on that side and more eroded on this side. And that's why the dome is asymmetrical. And that's why the, the <coughs> Pretoria group and the Dolomites and everything don't meet up on the southwestern side, southeastern side rather, because the erosion level is much deeper there. So Freyadefort is asymmetrical because it's tilted on its side. And I'll talk very briefly about why that's so later on. <coughs> okay, so the corollaries of this um, Freyadefort sitting in the middle of the Freyadefort of the, of the, uh, of the Witz Basin are that um, the Transvaal supergroup must have extended way beyond its present known limits. Um, and also that most of the Transvaal supergroup must have been underlain by Witwatersrand because it's unlikely that the an, a meteorite would have struck only that bit of the Transvaal that had Wits underneath it. Um, the stats are such that there must be lots of Wits around underneath the Transvaal. Okay, so and the second one, um, what's beneath the southern portion of the Craton because the Witz Basin has an, a northerly limit, we know that because of exposures, but what lies to the south under the Karoo? And this led uh, some colleagues and I 
um, to launch an investigation which took a long time, 20 years or so, a very slow pace, um, looking for what the, the geology of the southern part of the Kapok Craton. We knew where the Witz Basin was because of the work Borchers had done, compiling all the exploration data for the Witz Basin, did what's to the south of that, and we knew very little. So Branko Corner, one of our key members of our team, <coughs> um, had prepared this geophysical map. This is the total field aeromag map. And um, we, this, the yellow line is the boundaries of the Craton. Some people argue about these a little bit. Uh, but more or less, that's what, they, that's what they are. And you can see the Witz Basin because of the magnetic uh, shales in there. So there's three of the fort and uh, the three state gold field is down here. And it goes around uh, something more or less like that. Okay. So it, it's, it's very useful for, um, for looking for magnetic rocks in other areas. Now, we're predicting that there are, um, that we were interested in these anomalies down here. Uh, these linear anomalies, which had previously been interpreted as um, some kind of greenstone belt by uh, Branko Corner. In fact, the same guy who made this map in the early interpretations of the geophysics. <clears throat> but our assumption was that, um, that there must be other Witwatersrand basins because the Freudefort is telling us there are other Witwatersrand basins. And uh, we dug out some old drilling results for, from a guy who does a chap of the name of Ortlip, who published a, a thesis at the University of Pretoria and subsequently a paper in 1958, in which he reported the, the drilling of this magnetic anomaly here, which is the uh, Tromsberg complex. During the drilling of this, they intersected dolomites. And he interpreted these dolomites as uh, Transvaal dolomites. <clears throat> so the feeling was that we've got a Bushveld complex down here and it's intruding Transvaal. So we've got rocks down here that are exactly the same as the rocks you find, for example, at uh, Evander, the Evander Goldfield. We've got Witwatersrand Basin, we've got Transvaal on top of that, and we've got Bushfield on top of that. And it looks like we've got the same kind of thing here. So we surmise that this, this magnetic anomaly, the sharp one, the Nike tick, is, um, is in fact low of its. And therefore there's a, there's a Witz Basin sitting down here in that, in that syncline. Okay, so that was the hypothesis and it took a long time to raise the money to drill some test holes and uh, in the nature of things, uh, we intersected a lot of Transvaal uh, and Nick Bjorkus and his colleagues have done, who was, Nick was also part of the team. Um, he's done quite a lot. They found a spherical layer there, which is a um, very interesting in, uh, impact structure that uh, occurred during, during the dolomite, uh, during deposition of the dolomites. And they've traced it, they've seen it down here in our borehole and one of our boreholes. And uh, I've also picked it up in the, in the Campbell Rand series. Okay, so that work eventually led to this map, which is the, the pre Karoo geological map of the transfer of the whole Craton. And previously, stuff published by other people, and the bit that we contributed is down here. So we've got a big transfer basin sitting here. We've got a little bit of uh, what could be a bushfield complex. We are shown in green, the Tromsberg complex. There's some issues about the age. Um, I don't want to go into that. With, um, um, it might be a bit younger and it's got some other chemical signature, but it's certainly part of the Bushville province. And then we've got uh, this little basin here. This is the Bethlehem Basin. And we've got this one here, the Colesburg Basin. And if, interestingly enough, during drilling here, um, they also intersected, and we intersected it as well, Waterberg. So we've got all the same rocks that you see up in the north here, We've got them down south. So we've got Witz Basin there. We've got everything. Um, so the, 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 the reason then that the information or the, the clue that Freireford gave us is in fact substantiated that we have the same geology. And um, wherever you have um, a Witz, uh, you know, transfer basins, you've got Witz type rocks underneath. So, uh, so the Bits Basin was spread around. It wasn't really just one basin. The low of its Western group is probably one basin. The Central Rand group is probably a number of smaller basins, sub-basins. And uh, they are spread around all over the Craton. And uh, that augurs well. Um, he's an Australian. Uh, but this is what it looks like before we go and give Australia a bit of a boost. This is the distribution of the Witwatersrand 
uh, basins as we see them now, as we think they are. This one needs these. This one has been quite well off, well drilled um, during the heydays of the 80s, uh, Bethlehem Basin. This one is not discovered yet. Um, Anglo American were on the trail of it uh, when in 1990 um, they pulled the plug on all deep drilling and uh, deep coal mining became very unfashionable. Uh, so they stopped the exploration, but they would certainly have found it uh, going forward. You can see it on their seismic surveys very clearly. Okay, so now we go on to reconstructing the past, and this is the position of the Pilbara Craton the, of Australia uh, in an interpretation similar to the original one that was made by uh, Eric Cheney and uh, Twist, Dave Twist. Um, that's where it, they, 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 they fit us somewhere out on the edge here. Uh, but if you look at the um, the geometry of uh, of the Vitwasa Basin and also the shape of the craton, it fits more snugly over here, so we've moved it over there. The other interpretations, you know, the paleomagnetic people um, have put it way out here to the northwest, and other paleomagnetic people have put it way out there to the northeast, uh, but ignoring paleomagnetism, this is where it probably fits. And, and what about Vitwasa around rocks there? Well, there's this the gray supergroup, which has chronology similar to the lower bits. And here's the Nullagain, <coughs> which I don't think is properly dated, uh, but there's certainly a lot of conglomerates there and they contain gold. But this whole area of the, of the Pilbara is just a wash with gold, absolutely a wash with gold. There's so much gold, in fact, that they, um, I'll show you just now, they explore for it with metal detectors. They don't mess around with soil sampling and stuff. You go out with your metal, metal detector and you find gold. <coughs> Okay, so what were the depositional environments of the bits? This is a well-established, this is a, a drawing that I think originated in uh, I mean Goldfield's report. It shows the situation during the deposition of the VCR. <coughs> um, this is now, the concept has changed a bit. These are, the original idea was that the bits basin was surrounded by normal faults. I think that was a desperatorious idea. Um, it was like a stretch basin. Uh, but we now know that's wrong, and these these normal faults are actually reverse faults. But they they certainly the basin is fault bounded, and there are big reverse faults that sit here in the footwall. So here's our stratigraphy. So we've got these fan um, fan deltas coming out, depositing conglomerate in these big gray plains, and then we've got lava coming out here. This would have been the Fentersdorf lava, Western Area Formation, spewing out and burying it. And periods of, uh, of subsidence would obviously uh, push the, the, the basin outwards and periods of sea level rise would have uh, shrunk the basin down. So that would have given rise to alternations of deep and shallow water at any one profile. And hence we have this uh, stratigraphy that we see <coughs> in the central Rand group. The West Rand group is different. It's older and it's, it seems to be amazingly correlatable. You know, the marker units in the West Rand, like the contorted bed and the and the Ruppel Mark Court site that you can trace, they literally have been traced all the way from Swaziland, uh, is Swazi, I forget its new name, Swaziland, all the way to uh, uh, to the Free State, these same marker beds. And um, that represents, it would also represent a major marine transgression. There was some kind of um, pyrogenic subsidence and the sea flooded in and created the Western, the Western group. Um, but interestingly enough, there was a very, the, the, especially in the government subgroup, there are a number of, of very distinctive rocks. They're called diamictites, uh, uh, which the, some of them even, even mapped as tillites, in fact. And uh, so I'll talk about those quite a bit. Um, so there are indications. In fact, one of them, the, um, the coronation diamictite is now generally accepted as a, as a tillite. It's the oldest, as far as I know, it's the oldest tillite known on earth, but that we'll talk about later on. <coughs> So there you have the depositional environment and there was a series of alluvial fans and whatnot uh, debouching into rivers, debouching into these, onto these alluvial fans and creating a braid plain and that gave rise to the conglomerates. Okay, so we've got all these different environmental types um, and these are in summary here, they are the conglomerates of fluvial and beach gravels, maybe fan deltas. Uh, the quartzites and sandstones are fluvial beach shallow marine, siltstones, shallow, shallow to intermediate depths, mudstones are deep marine, and then the ironstones are distal shelf deposits. So when you have very, very high stands of sea level, then you get these ironstones forming. But the, 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 the problem rocks are the diamictites, pudding stones, they've been called in the old days. 
Salites, <coughs> um, and the origin of these is still controversial, except for one, the coronation diamond type, which is a salite. So we also find that frequently the conglomerates, especially the ones that contain gold, um, are associated with diamictites. And they can also be correlated over immense distances. So we have, for example, the main reef conglomerate. Um, and uh, that, uh, well, in that package, the main reef, the famous main reef, is associated with a, 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 a green, uh, what's a black bar, it's called a black bar, which is a diamictite and extends through to the green bar. So it goes all the way from the southern, the eastern, eastern basin, all the way through to the edge of the Col Carltonville area, the plate of Aitzif massively correlatable and this is true for many of them uh, here's a map this is a stratigraphic column um, which uh, was produced by the Sachs committee on the uh, Vitz working group and these you can see some of these diamictites marked here they could correlate them all the way from Velcom through to the South Rand and uh, Vanda hasn't got this lower Vitz preserved um, uh, there we got the uh, the Kimberley ones, very, very correlatable over huge distances. And they're not very thick. We'll talk about that just now. Okay, if we just go from the East Rand, <clears throat> we have a look because there, there, there are different uh, theories about the origin. So we've had a look, um, Paula Ogilvy and I, as part of one of the contracts we did at Chango Solutions. Uh, we looked at the distribution of diamictites in the far east, in the east portion of the Vitvaldus Run Basin. This red line here is the subcrop of the Kimberley Reef. Um, in the Evander, in the East Rand Goldfield, around Boxburg there, and Springs, and there's the Delmas Outlier, and there's the, this is the Evander Basin, there's the Kimberley Reef. And it's 100 kilometers long by 90 kilometers long. This, by the way, is the Burnstone, the South, uh, the South Rand Basin. So it's a huge area covered by a diamictite. And as I said, you know, some of the, this, that's the same diamictite you can correlate all the way to the Free State, I'll show you just now. And the three models are that they formed by, first of all, maybe debris flows, avalanche or hill slope deposits, they submarine avalanche deposits, or they glacial deposits. Those are the only way you can form these diamectites. So a surface debris flow will also include like um, scree slopes on hills, hills and whatnot, like stuff like that. <coughs> so generally speaking, um, those types of deposits are the ones that form catastrophically are confined to areas where you have a very high topographic relief. So we worked out that if you had a, a, the diamictite as, as, as an area of extent that I've shown you previously, to from the dynamics of these things, people have worked out equations for the size of the of the rock fall and the extent of the rock fall in terms of the elevation required to produce it. And you'd need an elevation of uh, nearly 4,000 meters on the edge of the Vitvaristan Basin in order to produce um, the extent of the diamictite just in the East Rand. Um, so that's also not really probable. The other one is the undersea slides, and the most famous of these is the Storega slide, <coughs> which occurred about 8,000 years ago, when a whole section of the continental slope of Norway um, collapsed and went down on this massive landslide, created a huge tsunami. Uh, the tsunami deposits have been quite well studied in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and um, this is a, a, a sonograph, sonog sonograph, sonographic view. These red lines are pipelines. There's a major gas field uh, situated just in this area underneath. And that's why this area has been studied so intensely. Uh, so this could do it, except that you'd, if the, this would be associated with, this is on the distal shelf. So this type of slide, this type of landslide would only occur and the distal shelf conditions, which is not exactly what you'd expect to see associated with conglomerates. So unlikely to be that. So the next possibility is an idea that was put forward by uh, Dr. Wiebels back in 1955, <clears throat> and he suggested the glacial origin for Wittwarderschrand conglomerates. And this was quite actually quite widely accepted in the literature at that time. And it lasted a few years until Des Pretorius came along and the idea was snuffed. This was a very um, forceful individual, and he saw the future of its, uh, the, the origin of its conglomerates as alluvial fans. So he introduced the idea of alluvial fans, and uh, everyone forgot about Dr. Wiebels. <coughs> uh, but you know, when we've, in the work that we've <coughs> done, contract work we've done at Chango, you, you, um, you look at a lot of things and you start to wonder, you know, why did so many geologists 
take to this idea so well, so convincingly, way back in the early 60s. So let's have a little bit of a look at that. And this is all that's the stuff you're familiar with, I guess, from geomorphology, <coughs> all done geomorphology. This is the typical snout of the, the end of a glacier. And you have all the glacial debris lying down here from the melting of the, of the, of the ice. And also you have um, outwash melt water that reworks all the sediments. So you have uh, sandstones and gravels and all that near the glacier. These are more terminal moraines where the ice has been stationary for a long time. So you get these ridges formed. And um, so those are the typical features. And <clears throat> one of the criteria, the key criteria that people like to use is striations. This is a, a boulder, it's about two meters uh, in this axis. Uh, and you can see it's very heavily striated. And that's a typical sort of um, uh, a, a glacial striation that you'd expect to see. But if you actually look at glacial debris, oh, there's a famous, this is a famous photo. No, well, not really famous, but this was a, a picture taken by Peter Candid Smith, who went to the, uh, the coronation outcrop. He was mapping in the East Ram Basin, and um, in his thesis area was the coronation diamictite, and he, the, the class were, were sort of weathering out from the matrix, so you could retrieve class in, in perfect shape perfect condition. And these are pictures he took, photographs he took. Unfortunately, the original, the actual specimens got lost when he moved from Cape Town to Johannesburg. Um, so they're lost, but this, these pictures were made from his thesis, excuse me. These are supposedly glacial striations. Okay, but this is what the pebbles look like at the end of a glacier. This is from uh, Iceland, where uh, one of the edges of the ice sheet uh, comes through between the hills. And um, the, the, very few of them actually are striated. It's normally the bigger ones that are striated and the softer rock types that are striated. But these are mainly basalts. And, um, and they, the, the, what's more characteristic, uh, rather than striations, are faceting. The pebbles are, they could ground quite quickly in the glacier and they get uh, faceted. So you get these flat surfaces that are typical of most of these, um, most of these samples. But very few of them actually have striations. And certainly the little ones, never see striations. Okay, so what about underground? What do we see? And uh, here's some very interesting work that's just done, very detailed work done at uh, in the Evander Goldfield. It was run by Union Corporation and their geology department was simply magnificent. Very thorough people and they took great pride in their work. And uh, there's quite a lot of diamectite underneath the Kimberley Reef at Evander. Here you can see in this section, these are the stoped areas. That's all the development, and uh, there's this big patch of uh, diamectite here, which was the reef goes over the top of it, but it's not it's not stoked because the grades were too low. <clears throat> but there's a cross section, and you can see on this here how the um, the gravels and the conglomerate and the diamectite sort of interfinger in each other, and then across the top, this very thin red line you can see is the nonconformity, and lying on that nonconformity is the Kimberley Reef. So the Kimberley Reef covers some places it's underlain by quartzites, very coarse grained quartzites, and other places by diamectite. Um, sort of planed off uh, that surface. Here's another one with diamectite and, um, and uh, Kimberley Reef lying on top. Here's another section from another part of the mine <coughs> where there's a little pocket, a little like scoop of uh, diamectite left. And there you can see the sort of coarse diamectite. There's a bit of um, mudstone here, and there's a boulder with a, a boulder of quartzite, which is a meter in diameter um, that was mapped in this in this underground development. <clears throat> and then the Kimberley Reef goes over the top. Now it's only well, this could be a debris flow, but it's most likely to be a large drop stone. So there's good evidence here to suggest that in the East Rand, at any rate, that the Kimberley Reef was associated with glacial activity. And that's why the guys they took to this theory of Weebles quite, uh, they took it to heart. The other thing you often see in glaciated terrains, uh, this is a photograph on the left here of Svalbard, um, is every now and then for reasons that are, are not clear, I guess to glaciologists they're clear, but the, the glaciers undergo surging and you get a, the glacier moves forward at a very rapid rate and that deforms this, the sediment underneath, the soft sediment that the glaciers deposit, the glacier previous generations have glaciers have deposited. So here's a cartoon taken from one of these papers by this guy, Benedictson, um, showing how the how this material gets pushed up 
into um, sort of a, a series of folds. It's like a fold thrust belt, actually. You get this thrusting and associated folding. So you get like a mini fold thrust belt. And um, it's actually mapped some of those on Iceland. Uh, you can see there, they're very detailed maps showing the, um, the fold thrust belts um, in, the, in, the, in the glacial moraine. And here is a photograph of, uh, from the Pras uh, of uh, Northern Canada showing exactly the same thing. Here you can see this deformation of glacial debris. There's the diamectite, there's some mudstones and siltstones here. And then it's been uh, planed off. And on top of that, you've got a fluvial gra gravel. These are uh, accretion surfaces. Form. These are meltwater channels reworking diamectite. So this situation is fairly common in, uh, in glacial terrains. And here, again, from Evander, there's another one of these scoop structures that is mapped in very great detail. And you can see these completely chaotic, um, I don't know if it's all that clear to you, but it's a very chaotic um, mishmash of rocks. And they just don't make geological sense. Um, and um, here you can see different varieties. So this would be like reworked glacial debris. Here it's sort of cross, broad cross bedding, like accretion surfaces. And here you've got glacially deformed sediment and maybe this kind of thing where you've at the terminus of a glacier where you have blocks of sediment that have locally reworked. So you have patches of conglomerate mixing with patches of mudstone and so on. It's a big sort of mess. Um, that develops there. So this is most likely to be um, a, represent um, what they call glacial tectonics, glacial tectonics, preserved in the foot wall and along across the whole top here is the um, Kimberley Reef sitting on that unconformity. This is another one from one of these sinuous channels in the foot wall of the Nigel Reef or the main reef as it's called in the Fries, in the Eband, in the uh, Fries, uh, East Rand Goldfield around Springs. Um, and Brackpan is Brackpan, uh, uh, it's called, this is on Brackpan Mine. And you get these weird uh, structures in this channel um, that are, they just defy zoological explanation. They are highly deformed and yet the rocks around them are completely undeformed. This is the, the Jeppistown Shale, perfectly normally bedded. There's this big wedge of mudstone that covers it. And then the Nigel Reef sits there across the top, undeformed. So you can say this is tectonic, but it's impossible to be tectonic because it occurs in this long snake-like um, channel. So uh, those are most probably glacial. So we'd, the sort of scene one would imagine for the formation of, um, of this conglomerates was, you can see it here on Iceland. This is the, the Skyder or Sander, they're called Sanders, these huge glacial outwash plains. And the nice thing is there's no uh, there's no major vegetation here. This is confined to lichens and stuff, mosses. <clears throat> and you can see this huge 50 kilometer wide plain, which is just a, a, a mass of channels, interwoven channels, covered with a very thin veneer of vegetation. Um, edge of the glacier looks like this, and there's all the debris that's come out. This here, the ice is actually detached uh, from the debris surface, so that's the actual basal contact. But the ice at, uh, in Iceland is very dirty because of the um, volcanic eruptions. Uh, so the ice, sometimes it looks black and you can't really tell what's ice and what's, uh, what's glacial moraine. And then the, there's the ice cap of Iceland. And during one of these big floods that they have there from time to time, you can see this lacy network of river channels that come out and rework this whole surface. So that's was what the bits uh, would have looked like in those times possibly, and, um, and it would be in that environment where the gold became concentrated um, by these by fluvial processes. <clears throat> okay, so why do they correlate over such huge distances, the glaciation, the, uh, the glacial moraines and the conglomerates? Well, because they are formed by glaciers and the, by, by large scale glaciation, we're talking about continental scale glaciation, so it's big glacial events that are actually responsible for the diamectites and the associated conglomerates. The other important thing is you find these unusually large pebbles very far. You know, we know that the, if you look at all the paleo current directions, there's generally a, a flow from the west and the north into the Witz Basin. 
but you find in very distal areas large pebbles. You know, if you've ever looked at the Amazon reef at Fredaport, you find these huge pebbles, and you're right virtually in the middle of the Bits Basin, <coughs> bigger than you see uh, typically around the edge of the basin. And also <coughs> down here at, uh, at um, Kronstadt, drilling there by Anglo American has found quite coarse grained conglomerates. And they actually cobbles, cobble conglomerates have been described here uh, in a thesis by, uh, <coughs> by a guy called Bass. Uh, and he's, they drilled um, it's a gold one drilled uh, a gold prospect here. And it's got these massive uh, conglomerate pebbles. Also find them at Harmony, Harmony gold mine out here in the Free State, much coarser than you find anything along the margin. So. Only explanation for that is that ice brings material into the region of the basin, gets deposited there, and then it gets reworked subsequently. So that's how you get local sources are generated within the basin because they're sources that have, of material that have been transported there by ice, by glaciers, continental glaciers. Okay, so this is the kind of scenario that we see. There's the Vitvardasan Basin in the top. That's the distribution of it. We imagine that uh, there are these big glacial sheets that come from time to time, come down through it and scrape up a lot of material and bring it down and uh, deposit coarse gravels all over the show. And of course, remember that Australia, the Pilbara fits in over here. So those glaciers would have gone across onto the, onto the Pilbara Craton, which at that time was part of the Kotbar Craton. Well, Barra is what Eric Cheney called it. Okay, what about carbon? Um, well, one of the things that's remarkable about the Skydra Sander is the amount of vegetation cover. Wherever the, 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 the rivers are not flowing at a particular time, you get invasion of, um, of lichen and then moss, lichen and moss. So they cover it. And it's not really a proximal to distal thing. <clears throat> you get it all over. It's simply a reflection of the inactivity and the uh, prolonged inactivity that creates this environment. And uh, I would imagine that in the Witz times, uh, those, that sort of plant, those are uh, eukaryotes, they wouldn't have existed, but there would have been the equivalent bacterial species um, that lived then. And so those, the, the surfaces and uh, perhaps underneath rocks, I don't know, maybe even on top of them, uh, would have been covered with this, um, this bacterial mats, bacterial mats, and they would have been there in, in areas where the, where the water wasn't actively flowing to disturb them. So that would have been the same thing. So these are carbon, carbon reefs. Now the braid plain goes right down to the ocean's edge here, in the case of the, the Svalbard, I mean the um, um, Skydra Sander. And uh, the, the, channel, the active channels, they actually uh, get focused at the end. There's a barrier bar, beach barrier bar running along the edge here. And um, here you can see there's the barrier bar blown up, it's mainly wind blown sand blown off the beach. And then at the back behind it, you get a lagoon and there's some ice flows um, floating on the lagoon. And then there's the conglomerates and gravels associated with the cider sander, in this case, covered with moss and lichen. So now you can imagine if there was a sea level rise, <coughs> what would happen? These things would be buried, but it's not, they're not buried exposed to waves or anything. They just get buried. Uh, they get drowned basically as the sea level rises and then they get fine silt and stuff on top and that would form then a layer of carbonaceous material um, draped on that surface. So that might be an explanation for things like the carbon leader. Um, they form during uh, um, sort of uh, marine transgressions, uh, but involving these kind of lagoon environments. So there's no rough wave activity or anything to disturb them. Okay, um, so the reworked fluvial material during a marine transgression about, is a very important thing in placer formation, obviously, can be. And we see evidence for that here in uh, South Island, New Zealand. Here we've got the, um, <clears throat> the Alpine range. And running through here is this very large fault, uh, the Alpine fault, fault system. And uh, this is the one that causes devastating earthquakes every now and then, like Christchurch experienced in the last few years. Uh, and Wellington as well, two years ago. Wellington is uh, here. And um, they, um, there's a lot of gold deposits all along this coastline here. And they've got these, these fossicking maps, you know, for tourists. You go along and you get your map and then you go out and you go take your pan and you go and find gold. <coughs> and that's the, one of the guide maps. And then these are other um, 
towns, um, and Hokotika is a very interesting place. Uh, but this whole Braid Plain, the whole plain, rather, coastal plain on the on the northwestern coast of New Zealand is a massive alluvial fan. It's just a coalesced fan. Unfortunately, you can't really see it because it's covered by this dense vegetation. Um, and um, But it's you can imagine this in days before there was any kind of significant land vegetation, this would have just been continuous gravel like this, like this, the sanders of Iceland. That's what it would have looked like. <laughs> And uh, that's what the conglomerates of the Witwatersrand Basin may be. There's also these underground gravel deposits. Uh, this are up above the present day sea level, where that should be mined for gold. This is they, some of these have been opened as tourist sites. And here you can go to walk through these various tunnels, underground tunnels, and this is what the conglomerates look like. Very, very matrix-supported, crappy-looking things. Uh, but apparently they they contain gold, and here's the remains of an old stamp battery. <coughs> And these were mined in the past. There's some quite large mines as well, um, which uh, I guess currently have been given a new release on life um, with the increase in the gold price. But this is a this is the beach at Hokitika, and this beach is made entirely of ilmenite. It's absolutely amazing. You know, I saw this black beach and took a sample home, and uh, there was virtually nothing magnetic in it. It was unless it's maghemite, but um, it um, it looked like it was almost entirely uh, ilmenite. So you get this massive wave action on the beaches and generates huge, huge deposits of uh, ilmenite. <clears throat> These are the black sands and maybe we've got, uh, certainly there are things in the, in the uh, East Rand Basin that are reminiscent of this, but now uh, of course converted to pyrite. Another place where you see the effects of, uh, of marine processes is up in, um, in the Bering Sea. This is the, this is the the, the Bering Straits here, that's Russia, and this is Alaska here. And um, a, a gold discovery was made at a little town here called Nome, N-O-M-E, in uh, 1898. They discovered gravel on the beach which contained gold, particular gold, nuggets. And so there was a, a mini gold rush uh, there at, that took place and the USGS went there and uh, wrote this report. They did a quite a large survey actually, and this was a report that uh, came out in 1977, which described these gravels. And uh, they did um, uh, drilling surveys and whatnot on the offshore, there's Nome, and it was on the beaches at Nome where they actually found the, um, the, the, the gold bearing, but they're actually marine deposits. And this is the map of the seafloor of Nome. This is a length of about 80 kilometers by five kilometers. And you can see it's mainly gravel, and coarse sand. Um, and this contains gold, I'll show you now. Uh, these, are, these are the various drill holes that they put down and these dots are the gold recovery. So it's just very crude, it's high, intermediate, low gold. And uh, the, the, survey, the, the survey method, the me method of assay really, really was a, a pan, an ordinary pan. So they would take a sample, I don't know how they, they didn't describe how they collected the sample out of the hole. But they would pan it and then they would look at the gold fragments and measure the sizes and whatnot. <coughs> so it's quite coarse gold, sort of what we would call nuggety gold, which you don't find in the bits actually. It's quite rare. Most of the gold is very fine. And if it does occur in nuggety port shapes, it's because of remobilization and uh, amalgamation of the gold on itself. So there's this huge belt of mineralization along the coast there at Nome. And uh, the, the survey of the ocean currents revealed that they're quite strong uh, uh, bottom currents. Bottom currents are up to a meter a second. And um, some over here in this, in this Bering Straits itself are even much faster, several meters a second. Um, and it's this, uh, this current activity that seems to be a big, play a big part in the concentration of gold. What you also see, this is of course the Yukon. This area here is the Yukon, and the Yukon is famous for its alluvial gold, and also for the primary gold deposits that, uh, that are the source of that gold. And these are alluvial deposits that are remnants from, um, from the mobilization of, um, of the bedrock during the last, ice, the last glaciation, which lasted up until um, just recently, a thousand years ago. But it lasted, so been a, the Pleistocene glaciations extended over a period of about two million years. And they scraped a large portion of, um, of uh, Canada, Canada and they transported all that material down south. And so there's a lot of uh, alluvial gold in the northern states of the US, but all of that gold has actually come from Canada. 
And uh, Nome here, it's probably the same story. There were alluvial gravels on the beach and in the, in the subsurface, uh, which have then been reworked by current activity and uh, gold has been further concentrated. On land, uh, the glacial associated gold, this is also from a US geology report. This guy's, this is one of these blogs, you know, the minus uh, blogs. Uh, he says glaciers are important in the north, but they've, uh, they've also greatly affected glaciers in California, Montana, and Western states. Um, so it's not just, in, not just an important consideration in Alaska and the Yukon. Glaciers are the source of nearly all the placer gold across the Midwest. And here how, here's how it goes. These are um, glacier uh, deposits, are mictites, and then within them you get these layers where there, there's been a still stand in activity and you get pluvial reworking and so on, and that produces a local, uh, a local high concentration. So here's a concentrated gold rich layer. This is from a USGS bulletin. So that's what they mine. And you may have seen that series on TV, gold miners, where they, the guys were filmed, turn it into one of those reality shows where the guys actually work these gravels. But Nome is not dead. And this is, a, this is the uh, current situation, 2020, this year, where they were auctioning uh, gold mining for dredging. So there's the little town of Nome, uh, that's down in India, somewhere. And uh, these are all the lease blocks that were being um, sold off by the Department of Minerals of Alaska. <coughs> uh, yeah, so it's still there. Now, the other thing about these glaciers is their very long uh, correlatability. This is the Kimberley, this is a, a map produced, a, a section rather, a schematic section, produced by the Kimberley uh, Working Group, which Jochen Schweitzer chaired. And uh, it represented um, geologists from all the mines, uh, producing mines. And um, they did it, this was done in the 19, uh, I guess, oh, about 1980s, 1990s. So they had, I think, up to 150 geologists contributing to this. And each geologist brought their, so their, uh, their sections of their mine, the geology and the stratigraphy of the Kimberley interval which is averaging about 200 meters in thickness, probably a bit less, but typically not exceeding 200 meters, but you can correlate the reefs over 400 kilometers, this 200 meter interval. And that's what they've done here, put together a correlation diagram without any particular ideas of or genesis or anything, they just correlated the rocks and everybody put their piece together and eventually they built up this mine, this whole basin view of the, of the correlation of the Kimberleys. And one of the striking things is you get these gravel surfaces, which are mineralized. These are the uh, mineralized Kimberley reefs. The most famous one is this one here, the UE1A. And uh, underneath that in the foot wall, there's a whole lot of others. Um, and and in, in the in foot wall, underneath some of these conglomerate layers, there are these deep channels, which are filled with um, mainly uh, shales. And, but they usually contain diamictites at the bottom. So they have diamictites in them and shales. And uh, <clears throat> there are various theories. That these are big. I mean, that's going to be hundreds of meters wide and, and you know, tens of meters deep. And they extend all over the show, all over, the, all over this uh, thing. They form this, these networks of channels. Um, the famous one, the Arndink Channel from the Free State Goldfield. OK, so what causes these? Well, <clears throat> in terms of a glacial model, we can get an understanding. This is a, this is a sea level curve for the last 500,000 years of Earth's history. It's a sea level curve. And the sea level curve um, is derived from, the, from glacial ice core measurements. So we know, uh, and also, also from, uh, from raised beaches and drowned beaches and so on. We're currently in a warm period and sea level is now at its, close to its highest. It has been a little bit higher. Uh, there's some nice raised beaches that you can see uh, they described in uh, those guidebooks to geology. Um, by Nick Norman down in the Cape. Um, but we're at the maximum now, but there's this peculiar pattern to it where the, the, the ice, um, the sea level, as the ice sheets grow, the sea level falls. So we've got a range of sea level which goes down to about 150 meters. So the 150 meters is, uh, is, is quite a lot, you know, if, if, you, if you were standing, say, in Cape Town on the beach at Sea Point, and uh, you're looking out to sea, and that sea level is 150 meters low, you wouldn't see the sea. It'll be too far away. So this is quite a, 
quite a quite a change but the change the rise in sea level occurs quite rapidly you can see here this this rise started about 10,000 years ago this this current rise so the sea level has risen about 140 meters in the last 10,000 years so you know we all panic about sea level rise and what's going to happen and so on boy when you look back at what's happened in the past it's, it's frightening and sea level fall too is also frightening um, so you get a sea level rise and then you get the slow oscillating decline. So what happens um, during the, when the sea level is at its low stand, if, you get a, if, it, if it goes low particularly quickly, it usually seems to do, then you get um, the sea level drops and then all the rivers are, are sort of left high and, high and dry really and then they start nick points and the nick points then migrate in so they create these channels channels um, related to the migration of nick points from the coast inland. You can see a little bit of that um, due on southern Africa due to the rise of southern Africa. So it's sort of inland like Oribe Gorge, uh, you get these beautiful meanders and then they reach a certain point and then the rivers all go straight. So it's the uplift of southern Africa. Southern Africa used to be much lower during the Cretaceous, probably almost at sea level. It looked a bit like Australia and then the whole continent has zipped up in the last 20 million years or so, and you've had this erosion, uh, backward erosion um, into the continent. Um, right, so the, so what happens then is when the sea level rises again, and it does so quite quickly, these, these valleys get drowned and they fill up with silt and mud. <clears throat> so, so those are what causes the, the channels probably in the Kimberley, uh, Kimberley group, and also underneath the main reef, we see them as well. Um, uh, but when it's when it's uh, when you get the slow decline, there's the erosion can sort of keep pace, and then you get placer formation. So during these slow uh, falls in sea level, you get base level lowering, erosive beveling, and uh, placer formation, and then you get this little drop, and then that creates the the, the, the nick points which then migrate inland, and uh, then the sea level rises and everything is drowned. <coughs> so the drowning of uh, these placers and whatnot takes place. Um, during this rapid sea level rise. You can imagine if you're looking at that sky of a sand I was showing you in Iceland, we get the rapid sea level rise, that whole flood plain, or, or, or gravel plain with, with lichen cover and all that will just going to get drowned. And undisturbed, it will remain undisturbed in that particular setting. Okay, so we got these big diamictite events that we can correlate all over. We've got the coronation diamectite, there's another one, the promise diamectite, there's the one, the green bar and the black bar, and then we've got the ones in the Kimberleys, and there's also one here in the, um, in portions of the uh, VCR, they also have, uh, also have diamectites associated with them. Okay, so that means uh, it's got quite important implications for the earth. Now, the, the oldest glaciation, as I mentioned, is this one here. The 2.9 one it's dated is the diamectite. This is the promised diamectite. Everyone agrees, no problems with that. And it's in the, because you find it in the Mazan group in, uh, in KZN, down in Swaziland, and it's found all over the bits. <coughs> There's another one that Martin De Witt um, and another guy, Furness, uh, described in the Noisy complex in the Unverwacht. This is a very controversial one. Don Lowe has written uh, st stinging attacks on this. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't agree, but anyway. There's something that looks like it could be diamictite, but it could be also a, um, a debris flow deposit. You know, one of those, it's one of those arguments. It's either debris flow or it's, it's, um, uh, it's glacial, uncertain. But let's say it's glacial. We've got a 2.9 glacial. We've got all these other diamictites that I've shown you through the bits, all the way through to the carbon leader, which is up here. And so we've got a whole stack of diamictites there representing possibly glacial events. Then we've got the 2.9 in the VCR. And there's also another one um, in, uh, in this Talia conglomerate of the Dewar supergroup, which is a possible correlative of the bits in India. And that's got a very prominent diamectite. Then there's another diamectite in the foot wall of the stillwater complex, which is between 2.710 and 3.140. So it could be one of these from the lower bits, or it might be this 2.7. And then, of course, we've got the famous Makanyani formation in the Transvaal supergroup, which represents snowball earth. This is the first snowball earth event, the earliest recognized one. So maybe these weren't snowball events, although they, the evidence is scattered all over the world. <coughs> the, 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 the continent, the fra continental fragments have also moved quite a bit over this time. 
and they've moved and separated and rejoined and so on. So it's not possible until you do continental reconstructions to decide whether these are, um, are uh, ice ages, just plain old ice ages, or whether they represent these uh, major events. Okay, um, so there's the Earth. The Earth was very cold then, and uh, that's why <coughs> um, uh, the, the, the glaciations appear to have been quite common, and that would be the related possibly to the faint young sun, because the Earth was uh, much less luminous and giving off less heat in those days than it does now. Um, so what does it look like in terms of comparison? If we had uh, uh, the, the kind of things we talked about in the Wits compared to, say, the, the last glaciation. These are the major ice seats. This is a view of the Earth from looking down on the North Pole. And there's, uh, there's what happened in the, the northern uh, Canada and northern the USA. And there's the size of the Carpal Craton in relation to those ice sheets. So it's very, very small. <clears throat> so there could have been quite large ice sheets around and they could have been uh, affected the bits and uh, it, you know just run over it really quite small. Um, Okay, so the Earth's Vardastron Basin has also got other features that need explanation, and these are the tectonic margins. And the gold fields, the main gold fields, all seem to lie or be closely associated with this tectonic margin. These, these are sort of thrust bound um, edges to the Earth's Vardastron Basin, thrust faulting. And you get structures like this. This is the free state gold field, and uh, the whole thing is folded up, um, and they mine, you know, they mine up to these unconformities. You get these major unconformities in the succession. Um, but there's another group of basins. This idea of, the, of what these thrusts represent was an idea that uh, colleagues and I proposed quite a few years ago. And the analogy was based on the Laramide orogeny of the, of the Western USA, Colorado, Utah, the Four Corner States and all of that. And if you put the Witz Basin into that region, it's about the same size as many of these basins, like the Unitar Basin, uh, Wind River Basin, and so on. They're about the same size and they're also bounded partly by, uh, by these reverse faults and uplifts and folds and whatnot. So it's not improbable and then you could put a glacier over this whole area. This whole area was covered by ice during the last ice age. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not particularly um, unusual for that sort of condition to develop. And we see also in another example is in New Zealand, there all this gold, there's a lot of gold activity associated or gold uh, mineralization associated with the fault systems, the Alpine fault here. And uh, that's a strike slip fault, and it's under compression. Um, there's a subduction zone here. Yeah, it's a very complicated geological setting. So it's a place from hell as far as geology risk, geological risks are concerned. It's New Zealand. So no one builds uh, brick houses, they ever builds houses out of wood. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the glaciers uh, bring the gold down, and rivers rework it on the coastal plain, and then it gets further reworked um, in the sub subsurface there. There must be quite a lot of gold and, um, and uh, heavy minerals offshore in New Zealand, although I believe New Zealand is rising slowly and possibly the effect of sea level change is, is quite different from other places. Okay, so Pilbara, of course, would have been uh, right in line of these big glacial sheets that would have moved across the, uh, during the Vardasran times, and gold, as I say, is extremely plentiful in the Pilbara. And uh, they explore for gold with metal detectors, you can see here. And this is, a, this is a place that was recently discovered a couple of years ago. It's a place called Karata. And um, it's associated with a, a conglomerate, so-called conglomerate. Uh, this, this is the conglomerate here. Looks like a diamictite to me. And it's underneath the Mount Rowe basalt, uh, which is the equivalent of the, the Mount Rowe basalt, the equivalent of the Pentersdorf uh, Cliff of Fiesberg. And this would be then the equivalent of the, of the VCR. Of the VCR diamectite facies. And uh, here you can see that the gold takes the form of these little nuggets. They're flat discs, actually, they look like uh, uh, watermelon seeds. And they search for them uh, with uh, metal detectors because they, you know, they, they're quite large, they're about uh, up to a centimeter sometimes, and they're flat. Okay, so to conclude all of that, um, <clears throat> what we've got um, in the Wits is evidence for free pool, frequent glaciations in Archean in the early Proterozoic. So that suggests to us that the Earth was much cooler at that time than it is today. Um, the architectural uniformity and character of the Kimberley Formation in particular shows that um, 
The glaciation must play a major part in the Kimberley formation. In fact, the, the unconformities that you find below the Kimberley suggest that the Kimberley reef itself is made by reworking of the footwall. And that footwall is, glacial, uh, is, a, is a, a glacial deposit, but it contains gold. So there must have been this recycling of, of, of material so that you form the diamectite, it then get eroded, weathered, and then gets reworked again and again and again. And slowly the concentration of gold has been in, increasing with each successive cycle of reworking. So, uh, so that's probably one of the reasons why there's so much gold in such a uh, confined space. So we've got at least uh, five major glacial episodes in the Vipartisrand Basin. They probably represent ice age conditions. And um, so ice probably was the, the major um, dispersal mechanism for gold and possibly played a significant part in its local concentration and reworking because it was the source of water. To produce all these conglomerates and stuff, you need a lot of water. And um, you know, the kind of classical model of the alluvial fan with examples coming from Death Valley uh, are just untenable. It's, it's not like that at all. Uh, the best examples of, of uh, pebble size and pebble bed forms and all that that you can find to, as analogs of them, it's all occurring glacial of course, uh, deposits. Okay, so the, the distal outliers of the Witwatersrand Basin <coughs> are going to be there. They're going to contain gold and it's just a matter of finding it. Um, so with a Vitz Basin is far from dead. Uh, it's got a great, great future ahead of it. There's new Vitvatasran basins that are going to be discovered and maybe they'll be as rich as the, as the ones that we've already got. Um, but it's, uh, to my mind, it's, it's a very promising situation we have ahead of it. Okay, so that's the talk. I just want to thank uh, Stuart Conline and Larry Newoff and the April uh, management um, for um, pursuing our vision of finding new Vitvatasran basins and also Pan-African resources for use of unpublished company uh, reports and stuff uh, from the Evander area. And also Jochen Schweitzer and uh, our colleagues, uh, Paula and my colleagues at Chango uh, for creating such a stimulating work environment <coughs> where one can have the opportunity to come up with these uh, unusual, maybe unusual ideas. So thank you very much for listening and it's, I'm only eight minutes over, so that's good. Thank you and cheers. Thank you very much, Spike. Um, a very interesting talk. I'm sure there's going to be comment and questions. And I'll open the floor now to that. Thanks. Just unmute Thanks. your mic and go for it. If, yeah, could I, I just ask a question about uh, when you you said that uh, eukaryotes uh, couldn't have existed then. When, when would you put the, the start of eukaryotes? They, um, you know, as far as I knew, as far as I know, they started at the time of the uh, of the great oxidation event, um, and they started by a symbiosis of um, <clears throat> of uh, various uh, bacterial forms that existed before that, and um, the reason was because the oxygen. Most of the most of the organisms that were living until the, the great oxidation event, GOE they call it, um, were were a, um, they were ana anaerobic. They couldn't stand living in oxygenated environments. Um, and this is apparently why they they developed the symbiosis because they um, they they clustered together to create um, an environment where the the, the the little goodies, the organelles in the cells, are themselves and, um, and, and anoxic, and they could create an environment where the overall cell is anoxic, um, but if they could live, they can continue to survive. So it's something, some idea like that. There was a woman, Lynn Margulis, who came up with this theory. Uh, it was again one of these sort of off-the-wall theories, but it's now generally um, regarded as the as the actual source of life. So the eukaryotes uh, are the product of that, and then of course they. Some of them took on um, the what are called the, the, the little green um, um, oxygen consuming um, um, bacteria, and those are the, the, the plants, the flower, the plants, and then of course the animals uh, didn't take those on. So we haven't got them, but the, the, the plants have. But so it's around about two, uh, around about uh, two, two billion years ago. That's when they formed. So the prior, prior to that, there were only 
anaerobic, uh, no oxygen in the atmosphere, essentially anaerobic conditions, but not so anaerobic that sulfur was uh, preserved. Um, but, uh, you know, so there was no sulfide around, well, very little anyway, it was not very different from today, but they were, but certainly there was no oxygen. Maybe a lot of CO2. The, the atmosphere must have been mainly CO2, probably, I would imagine, uh, about 95% or more CO2. Carbon monoxide may have been around, but certainly no oxygen. Thanks, Stuart, Mike. you got your hand up? Yes, yeah, hi. Um, what was the duration of this Witwatersrand ice age in comparison to the one that we're in at the moment? Um, yeah, look, I, it's difficult, obviously, to, um, to pinpoint the age of, you know, sediments are notoriously difficult to date. And you have to date them by, by secondary, um, you know, secondary processes. And unfortunately, there are very few volcanic horizons, mainly volcanic rocks that are most amenable to dating, but there's, there's only two volcanic units in the whole of the Witz Basin. And uh, in fact, one of them is widespread, um, the crown lava, but the other one, the bird lava, is only occurs in a very small part on the central rand and a little bit in the west rand and in the east rand and Evanda, but elsewhere it's not there. And that one is not, it's, the dating is very scrappy on it, I think because of secondary alteration, metamorphism. So we don't know how long these things were. Um, but you know, one of the remarkable things about, if you look at, if you think of it in terms of a fluvial model, you know, these conglomerates like, um, like for example, the basal reef has been mined over uh, probably hundreds of square kilometers. And it retains its character over hundreds of square kilometers. Now, that cannot be a fluvial system. It just cannot be a fluvial system because fluvial systems will show proximal to distal variation. But that shows almost nothing. Uh, and the same with the main reef on the central rand. You know, these, then the, the Nigel reef in the east rand, these things just go for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers without changing character. Now, those suggest to me that those are actually time surfaces. They must have all formed in a relatively short uh, or duration, or they persisted for a very long time during one of those, maybe those progressive declines in, in sea level. So that the base level was slowly falling and the rivers could maintain and gradually work their way down and um, release all the gold from the from the underlying diamectites uh, like for example you find in the Yukon uh, like that which I showed you from the USGS report um, that the gold gets concentrated so they might form in periods of hundreds of thousands of years or maybe a million years or something and then conditions change and that that whole surface then gets buried by, um, by a rising sea level, the only way you can, uh, on unconformity, so the only way you can preserve an unconformity is to drown it um, or blow sand over it with a wind or wind erosion, um, you know, wind um, sort of desert deposition. So yeah, I'd say they're, they're relatively short intervals, but to actually time, uh, I don't think the geochronological tools are yet available to do that. So we, it's an interesting idea if we could date them, then we'd know for sure. But it's, I don't think it's possible. I'll take one more question. Yes, thank Bo, you very much. Pleasure. And Bo, you've got your hand up. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, we know that the, the gold in the West Basin is associated with the conglomerate, but yep. uh, that was saying that it's not associated with alluvial deposits. I just wanted to have a clear on that one. With what, sorry? Oh, alluvial? Sorry. Yeah, alluvial deposits. No, it's an alluvial deposit. It's formed by, uh, you know, gold has obviously got a very high density. And um, as, the, uh, as the ice, or not the ice, as water flows, it will, it will um, the low density material will gradually get washed away. And the gold dense, the dense gold and uraninite and stuff like that, other uranium minerals, dense minerals will get trapped behind. So you also find, for example, typically the Witwatersrand conglomerates not only contain gold, they contain uh, quite a lot of ilmenite. Well, it's not ilmenite anymore, it's granite, and they contain uh, titanium, I should say, they contain titanium. And they also contain a lot of zircon, zircon grains, and they, uh, they contain other garnets, quite common in the Wits. So other heavy minerals, as 
have also concentrated there, but not to the extent that gold has. Gold is quite amazing. And I think it's repeated cycles of, of reworking that have uh, by glacial and, and then fluvial and glacial and fluvial that have actually produced this massive, con this massive concentration. So a lot of crust, typical greenstone crust has been processed in order to form this, this huge amount of gold. Um, that, you know, to concentrate it to such an extent that to produce a Witz Basin. Well, you know, the Witz Basin has produced about 40% of all the gold ever mined in the whole world. 40% of it comes from the Witz Basin. It's just staggering. And it's only 300, 300 kilometers by 200 kilometers in size. It's tiny. And it's produced 40% of all the gold ever mined. It's just staggering. So something unusual happened here. Um, but as I say, it's, it's not, there must be others, and there must, certainly there are others in South Africa. It's just a matter of having the patience and the money to go and find them. And uh, I would say there's a fair chance they exist in the, in the Pilbara as well, underneath the Hammersley, uh, the Fortescue volcanics there. And uh, so we were, the guys at Chango were involved in a project uh, in the Nullagine, and they certainly found, found some interesting looking things. But the geology of that area is so. When I look at it, I try and read papers on it, it's, it's incomprehensible because they have a terminology that's just diabolical. The stratigraphic terminology is just diabolical. It's, it's almost impossible to understand. They need someone like Alex de Toy to go out there and sort it all out for them and put things in their proper order. Uh, then they might make some discoveries because they must be there. There's so much gold there. It must be there. And yeah. So yeah, no, Plasso, uh, this is a Plasso deposit. Thank you, Spike. I, I think I'm going to end it here. Um, but I'd just like to comment that this is a this is probably going to be remembered as a very important talk in the uh, thinking on the Witz Basin. And I thank you very much, and the GSSA thanks you very much for delivering it to us. Thank you. Today. Um, did you record it, thank you way? so much. Uh, sorry, um, Nolin, did you record the talk? You did. I did indeed. Good. Okay. No, that's fine. So. You're going to put it so, on your, your page. We are. Thank you so much for that. No, it's a pleasure. Good, because I, I don't have the energy to write papers much anymore. And uh, <laughs> I don't ever write the story up. <laughs> Good thinking then. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, that was enjoyable. I love the story, I must say. Thank you very much, and thanks, thanks once again to, to Tacoma Strategies for sponsoring in September. Um, with that, I'll close the meeting. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Spike. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Spike. Pleasure.